Hello everyone. Last week, we began the story game Greymane, in which we talked about his youth, growing up with his father's advice to never take another's hand, and leading the people of Gilneas. The war against the Horde, the formation of the Alliance of Lordaeron, until Gen had enough and he decided to build a massive wall around his city. A wall that could not hold out against the massive numbers of the Scourge, so they decided to go with Archmage Aragal's plan of summoning the Worgen from a realm which they described as a dark place, a place of nightmare, but it was actually the opposite. The origin of the Worgen that takes us back in time, like 9300 years back, to a war called the War of the Seder. Night Elves fought against demons and satyrs, enemies left over from the War of the Ancients, and some felt that an advantage was needed to turn the tide of battle. The Lyre Fangfire backed Malfurion to allow them to use their pack form, but despite the power that form offered, it was uncontrollable, so their Shando told them not to use it. One dire battle, the druids threw caution to the wind and slipped into this form, which allowed them to survive and win the battle, but it also turned them on their own Night Elf allies. After killing a fair few of their own, some were able to regain control, and Arval, Relar's best friend, he told his love Ballista Starbreeze that he would never use this form again. He would not turn himself into a monster to kill monsters, and this ultimately led to his demise at the hands of satyrs and the creation of the Scythe of Alun. In her grief, Ballistra agreed to Relar's plan of combining the Staff of Alun, an item which held Alun's noble power and enchantments, with a Fang of Goldrin, which embodied the feral nature of their pack form. Legends told of Alun's desire to tame Goldrin's ferocity, and perhaps with this combination, they'd be able to soothe the chaos at their form, use it as they desire to get their vengeance. Instead, Goldrin's essence rejected the Moon Goddess, and their ritual backfired, turning Relar into the Alpha Prime and creating the Druids of the Scythe. Their feral nature had taken them over, their bites now transformed others into their worgen form as well, and Relar did not only turn against the satyr, he once again struck out at his own people, believing Malfurion to be responsible for his best friend's death. In the end, Malfurion used the Scythe of Alun to banish Relar and his fellow worgen to the realm of the Emerald Dream, where he hoped they would remain pacified at the base of the majestic tree called Daranir. This was the tree where once upon a time Malfurion himself was brought by none other than Scenarius, when he too had experimented with the pack form long before the Lar had. That is why he had forbidden it, and this great tree, it was able to bring Storm Rage back to his senses, but the Scythe of Alun had perverted their ways. The form they now held was beyond Druidism, so bringing them back to their senses that was out of the question, but at least the tree could keep them pacified. Slumber instead of execution, it seemed like a better option, but to the Worgen it was torture. They were meant to run, to hunt, you cannot tame what is meant to be wild, but for millennia, they were forced to slumber within the Emerald Dream. So that's where Arugal summoned his forces from, and now we see the Worgen, led by Alpha Prime, turn on Gilneans. Gen has a festering wound, the priestess Ballistra is helping him control it with the powers of Alun. Our forces have been ambushed within the cathedral, but the battle isn't over yet. <laughs> Enough. 
Godfrey has no compassion for the people of Gilneans that have fallen to the Worgen curse, but Greymane sees it differently. He's had a lot of time to think about the past, the decisions he has made. If things had gone differently between him and Crowley, they could have fought off the Worgen together, they could have saved Gilneans. Lorna will never forgive him for her father's death, and he doesn't know if his people will ever forgive him for losing their city. Maybe they shouldn't. His father certainly wouldn't have been able to, but in Liam's mind, there's nothing to forgive. For him, his father is a great leader who's done what he believed to be the best for his people, even if he didn't always agree. Yet in the recent past, he feels like his father has lost faith in himself. If he can just find a way to believe in himself once again, he's sure that their people will believe in him too, and they will forgive anything. Now it was Greymane who gave the order to trap instead of kill, the reason why we as the players were not shot on sight. The potion Belisra and Krennan had been working on, it did the trick, it gave us some sort of control over our minds back, but our humanity is still lost. We were only recently bitten, there are more worgen, feral Gilneans that have dealt with the curse for much longer. It's uncertain if the potion will actually work on them, but time for doubt is a luxury that Gen doesn't have. The Forsaken attack by sea and he gives the order to double the dosage and release them. He will lead them himself. It's high time that these Forsaken bosses learned that there's nothing more dangerous than a cornered animal. Gilneas makes a stand as we help out with taking out the Forsaken forces and the captains of the ships. But the Cataclysm is hitting the land hard and the ocean swallows everything. Everything. The land, the Forsaken, our own people are claimed. We do our best to save as many as we can while we make ready to evacuate Duskhaven and head on over to save ground to Greymane Manor. It's there where Queen Mia Greymane is trying to keep the people calm while her husband is up in the observatory again where you can clearly see that the Horde isn't giving up quite yet. We have no choice but to move further inland. Along the way, we also help out Prince Liam, whose carriage was attacked by ogres, until our journey takes us to Taldoren and some of the night elves that had joined Balistra. We find out that Darius Crowley survived the ambush at the cathedral, and he has also become a worgen. We secure the scythe of a loon that ended up in the hands of the Forsaken. In the comic, Alpha Prime is defeated, and we even undergo a special ritual. The potion that we took at the start that has kept the beast at bay, but it won't last forever. The night elves, familiar with the pack form, they offer us aid as we drink from the well of fury, tranquility, and balance. Let us be blessed with the wisdom of our people and the ferocity of Goldrin. Just as the majestic tree Dadalnir soothed the worgen in the dream, let Taldren soothe our spirits. Let the scythe unbind that which was not meant to be bound. Let the soul master the beast, lest the beast master the soul. In game, the ritual looks real easy, but not all of them make it through. Everyone has to battle with their own demons, but when successful, we master the animal inside and we even regain some of our humanity by being able to transform at will. Crowley, you and your elven allies are hereby ordered to serve along the king's army. Cursed or not, you are still bound by Gilnean law. Does this toad speak for you again? You come to our dwelling as a friend, or do you come as a tyrant? No, old friend. I've come to you as an equal. Im Possible. I again. It is not law that binds us. It is something far stronger. My men are ready to give their lives under your command. It is decided then. We will unite all Gilneans and drive the Forsaken from our lands. A bond stronger than law now binds the former friends, former enemies, so much closer. Gilneas, Worgen or not, we stand together while we move our people through the Black Waltz. But as you might imagine, Godfrey isn't too happy about all of this. He has no love or trust for the Worgen. In his eyes, they're cursed beasts, and now his own king is one of them. He travels together with Gen, a man that he once thought he knew. A proud, fierce, and intelligent man. A man who made bold choices for the good of his people, despite what others thought. A man like his father, a patriot, but that man is dead. There was a time when we would have liked minds, you and I, two compatriots strengthening a nation we loved. There was a time where we hunted Val Worgen, shot him dead without his second thoughts, and now you've all but taken him in as family. See? You're the traitor, and you always told me that traitors must be punished. The only way to counter these forsaken threats is to negotiate with them. In order to negotiate, I need to possess something that they want, and now I do. So get settled, Majesty. The Royal Alchemist Krennan is tossed out of the vehicle, and he lets us know what's going on. With a potion of his design, one that grants us stealth, we assassinate the traitorous lords, and we save our king. No, I'd sooner die than have one of your kind for a king!
And he's not kidding either. Godfrey runs off the cliff and ends his life, only to be later resurrected by the Forsaken, but that's a different story. A few days later, outside of Gilneas, Gen has a talk with his son Liam, as he confesses that he was the one who told Arogal to summon the Worgen. The prince had told his father before, and now he says it again. In his mind, there's nothing to forgive. We'd never spoken of it, and some things aren't always easy for me to communicate, Gen said. I've never told you I love you, son. I've never said those words. But I mean them every day. While we help out the people, we're fighting off some of the Forsaken troops at Emberstone Mine and Village. In the comic, Gen bears his soul to his people. He reveals to them, despite the fear of his people rejecting him as a leader, he shows them all what he has become. He is a worgen. But for them, he is still their king. And together, with every available Gilnean rallied and armed, the battle for Gilneas is upon us. The Forsaken think we are weak. A broken people. They think we'll roll over like a scared dog. How wrong they are. We will fight them in the fields until the last trench collapses and the last cannon is silenced. We will fight them on the streets until the last shot is fired. And when there is no more ammunition, we'll crush their skulls with the stones that pave our city. We will fight them in the alleys. Until our knuckles are skinned and bloody, and our rapiers lay on the ground shattered. And if we find ourselves surrounded and disarmed, wounded and without hope, we will lift our heads in defiance and spit in their faces. But we will never surrender! Oh, Abominations are blocking the way towards the military district. This won't be easy. The villagers were thankful to have Emberstone back. They brought us a little something to help against the Forsaken. You're a sight for sore eyes, Lorna. Let's get those cannons manned. The rest of you, lure the abominations into the open. The battle for Gilneas, it takes us back to where it all began, as we follow Liam through the cities, taking one district back at a time. Together with Crowley's forces, we take out Gorrut, until the Banshee Queen herself becomes our next target. Let us join your father's forces, Liam. They'll need our help against Sylvanas. Block their retreat, Liam! We've got them right where we want them! This actually takes place after Sylvanas tossed herself from the top of Ice Crown and returned to lead her people in his war, a war ordered by Warchief Garrosh Hellscream. She was going to do this her way though. The Forsaken are no longer arrows in a quiver. Now they're her bulwark against the infinite. The hell that she saw when she ended it all, and she will let no one carelessly toss away her defenses. Our prey may be cornered, but the Banshee Queen did not come unprepared. Father! Liam! No! We did it, Father. We took back our city. We took back. That arrow was not meant for Gilneas, her favorite son, but Liam took it for his father all the same. We do not have the luxury of grief while the enemy still breathes Gilnean air. Crowley is ready to strike, and we must track her down where we still have the Banshee Queen's trail. This leads us back into Lysdown Cathedral, where we find out some disturbing news. It appears you're losing control of Gilneas, Sylvanas. Garrosh fears he's going to have to carry out this invasion himself. You can assure Garrosh that this is a minor setback. Our victory in Gilneas will be absolute. You sound very confident, your majesty. I seriously hope you do not plan to use the plague. Garrosh has explicitly forbidden it. You'd do well to watch your tone, General. Neither you nor Garrosh have anything to worry about. We've ceased all production of the plague, as he ordered. We'd never deploy it without his permission. Speak quickly. I will deliver my report to our leader, then. Go with By honor, your lead, General. My lady. My lady, should I order my men to stop the deployment of the plague? Or are we to continue as planned? What kind of question is that? Of course we're deploying the plague as planned. Let the Gilneans enjoy their small victory. Not even their bones will remain by tomorrow. As you wish. 
despite Garrosh telling her not to, Sylvanas is planning to turn Gilneas in a plague-infested hellhole, and a choice has to be made. It's Gen's most difficult choice of his life. He wants to enact swift and brutal vengeance for the death of his only son, but that would not be honoring his memory. Liam has always cared for the people first and foremost, and so will his father. While we fly out on a capture bombing bet and unleash some help on those who seek to bring the plague to our people, the rest of Gilneas evacuates. We follow shortly after through the tunnel, but in our hurried escape for safety, we disturb the resting homes of our ancestors. This is a grave sin. The stampede of people fleeing from the tunnels, they've unearthed the mementos, burnt with the fallen, so we collect them, we offer them at Edric's tomb, where we also put Liam to rest. May the light bless the spirits of our ancestors, for they've chosen to allow my son to rest upon this holy ground. It is here, surrounded by the heroes and patriots of Gilneas, where he belongs. You were a true man of the people, Liam. Unlike any royal I've ever met, we'll make them pay for this. Gilneas will remember your courage forever, Liam. We'll return, Liam. I swear this to you. One day, Liam. One day, we'll return. But for now, Gilneas must be abandoned. Thankfully, the Night Elves did make good on their promise, and Emerald Nightwind has shown up with vessels to get us out of here. While they make ready to set sail, we buy some time by taking out the unrelenting hordes, and we also blow up the airship so that they can't murder us from the sky. Attack! I want two sharpshooters to stay behind and cover the deck. Everyone else, use the ropes to repel down. Let's give them hell. Hands up, greenskins! My men will give you your new bearing. You try anything funny, and we'll fill you with lead. The rest of you, follow me downstairs. We've got the explosives in the furnace room. Just hold them off now. That's one big orc. It's about to blow. Jump on the wyverns. It's about time to get out of here. If we leave now, we'll leave the Forsaken Fleet in the dust. Now for the players, the journey is quite uneventful, while the trip in the story dead took quite a bit longer and had some difficulties because of the Cataclysm. Greymane is on a ship with Talar Oaktelen, who offers him a hand to get out of bed since the king's body is still hurting from the last battle for Gilneas. This old king needs not your help or anyone else to leave a bed, Talar Oaktelen. Of that, I am still capable. He brought himself to his feet, embracing the wave of agony that splashed his back. The old teachings of his father. There's still a big part of Greyman's character and motivation, but trying to do it all on his own, that is what got him into this mess to begin with. That would soon enough become clear to him, as a massive storm with waves three times the size of giants, they cut their ships at sea. This was no natural storm. These were the aftershocks of Deathwing breaking out of the world and causing the cataclysm. Their plan was to form a massive flotilla, binding their ships closely together. That way, they had a better shot at fending off the brutal storm than each ship would have on its own. Gen noticed that Alun's radiance, the ship carrying his wife and daughter, that was still unaccounted for. Demanding a spyglass from a night elf sailor, he peered through the glass and he saw that Alun's radiance, it was guiding a damaged ship. Another wave, 80 feet high, hit them hard. Gen could see the wave roll further, towards the vessels carrying what he held most dear in life. Before anything could be done, the surge crashed into the lumbering vessels, and the two transport ships collided into each other. Despite the horrific storm, Talar quickly called for rescue vessels, and Gen wanted to come with. That's not something that they could allow, it was their mission to get the king and his people to Darnassa safely, and they couldn't risk his life. It was a dangerous task, but they were all that Gennett left. He could not stay, he could not! This was his family, and he owed them much. Even now, with their world shattered to pieces, even accounting for every foolish choice he had made, me and Tess still believed in him and supported him. He took a deep breath, and he let out a roar. He could feel the change, his body expanding, his hair rapidly growing, his face extending into a grizzled muzzle. In his worgen form, he jumped from the side of his ship, dropped down into the lifeboat, and he joined the mission. A good thing too, since by the time that they reached Alun's Radiance, his wife and daughter 
water were nowhere to be found. He moved into the ship, despite the large warnings, and first he found a group of sailors trapped behind some wreckage. Not even his wargun might was enough to move it on its own, but together, combining their forces, he was able to get them out. They told him that his wife's cabin was much lower, and with that, Gen released his grip and he let himself drop down, through the hull and through the smoke of the fire. Help us! It was a woman's voice. It was Mia's voice. Gen knew it instantly. He reached out his hand, clasping a doorframe, stopping his fall. I am coming, my love! Turns out that when the ship crashed, a dresser fell on Mia's leg, shattering it, and Tess couldn't leave her mother behind. Mia even told them both to just go, to leave her behind, but Gen wasn't hearing it. Shh, there now, my love. I will get you out of here. You must hold on. Through her pain, she gave him the wide-eyed smile that always brightened up her entire face and crinkled her button nose. It was the smile that had made him fall in love with her all those years ago when they had first met at the Royal Adric Banquet. She was going into shock from the pain, but her smile was still radiant. Grab on to my back, daughter. We must make haste. Tess wrapped her arms around his burly frame, and with a focus he had not felt in days, can charge into the smock, holding on to Mia with every fiber of his being. The decks were virtually flooded, and the hallway leading towards the bow was submerged. With one arm, he pulled himself forward, lumbering upward, with Tess helping to hold on to her mother. Slowly but surely, Gen willed himself and his family onwards, fighting against the rising water. The ship was plunging deeper, and time was not on his side. With one last burst of energy, he raced as fast as he could towards the exit. Outside the porthole, he could see the lifeboats huddled close together, receiving the final few survivors. Talar! The queen is injured! You must help her and the princess! Gen yelled, his voice bullying its way through the winds. Drop them down! I will retrieve them! We can heal her! Talar shouted back, impressed with what he was seeing. Gen looked to his left and to his right. These two women were what he had to live for now. No nation, no son, they were his everything. Despite the pain that was sure to come, Mia told him that she could endure any pain as long as he was near her. She was dropped and Tess quickly followed. Greymane was about to pull himself out, but then a massive vacuum pulled him from below. As if yanked by some great force beneath, the Yaloon's radiance jetted downwards. Gen's eyes went wide as he was knocked back instantly, tumbling down the cabin into the flooded hallway, a suction pulling him down, down into the guts of the drowned ship. He fought the pool behind him with everything what he had. He fought the blackness in his mind that was trying to draw him under with equal force as the water. Opening his eyes, he could see an extended violet hand reaching through the window. It was Talar, his other hand holding the window frame tight as the currents tried to yank him inside. Gen looked right into the glowing eyes of the night elf, then down at the outstretched hands. Talar had come for him. He had risked his life to rescue a man he barely knew and barely liked. With one final act of exertion, summoning every ounce of strength that he could, Gen launched himself forward, his own hand reaching until it clasped the large right grip, and then everything went black. Gen woke up on the ship again, with Talad at his side. He was grateful for the Nidal saving his life, and he had come to understand that his son would have made a fine king, a better one than the stubborn old man that he was. The prince had understood that there were always other ways to consider, that different times call for different actions. Perhaps we can all consider other ways, Talar said. Your people are stubborn, and so are you. But without that trade, many of the sailors would not be alive today. He offered a hand again, to help Gen out of bed. But this old king needs not your help or anyone else's to stand up, Talar Oaktelen. Tell me you did not forget this. And he pulled himself up, wearing a sly grin. Talar broke into hearty laughter. As you would have it, my friends. Talar was still chuckling. It was the first time Gen had heard a night elf laugh or see him smile. His whole body hurt, but his mind was clearer than it had been in weeks. You said to me that this Arthur Stormrage believes my people would be an important asset to the Alliance. That I did. Perhaps he is right then. Perhaps he is right. And that's how Greymane and the Worgen completed their journey to the land of the Calderai and were welcomed by Turanda and Malfurion. The old stubborn man has come to realize that accepting a hand from time to time, not being stuck in your own mindset, that is of great value and will surely come in handy when they ask for the Alliance to not only give them a hand, but open their arms and welcome them back into the fold. Varian Rin still remembers the man that Greymane used to be, but that's a tale we're going to save for next week. So as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!